Well, a very good day, everybody. My name is uh, is Callum. I am from DX Commander, and RSGB have asked me to give a presentation to the convention. And I think the topic was kind of left up to me, as long as it was something to do with antennas. I've I've called this an obsession with antennas because in the modern world we buy radios, right? Now, 50, 80 years ago, people were making radios either from kits or you know old televisions or something or did they have tvs then i can't remember they'd make them from kits you know from old junk all sorts of stuff and people are still doing that there is a market for the home brewer and the radio front but i'm an appliance operator like most of us are these days Therefore, the one thing we really can change about our lives and about how we operate and about how efficient we are and how well we can hear, how well we can transmit and so on and so forth, is the antenna. And I don't know about you, but I go around B&Q or if you're in America, Home Depot, and I'll see a painter's pole or something. I'm the first person. Wendy's going, what are you doing now? <laughs> I go, oh, wait a minute, this could be a good support for a portable doublet, you know. An obsession with antennas so i think what we should do is just lay down a couple of axioms first thing i want to talk about is decibels now it's got a good history dbs okay it started off with bell bell telephone bell laboratories i don't know bell okay and they noticed when they polled their customers that a customer could definitely tell when the volume had dropped enough to go oh the volume's gone gone down they called that one bell okay it was all to do with a standard cable mile or a cable mile standard or something very old school stuff but as they improved their measuring techniques they discovered it wasn't enough granulation in the bell so they called it a decibel tenths of bells hey now db is quite interesting you can't no, under normal circumstances you can't put an antenna up or and they use dbs for optical glass radar it's all sorts of stuff where we use the term db you can't have oh i switched on my gadget today and it was 4 db Four, it's got to be 4 db better than something right? it's relative to something else we often use dbi dbd db v dbw and i'm just very briefly going to explain what that is because i'm going to be talking about dbs and i just want all of us on the same page so let's talk about something called an isotropic radiator now an isotropic radiator is an imaginary antenna which is infinitely small okay and it radiates in all directions so it's a sphere it's a sphere of RF radiates everywhere it's imaginary because we can't make one of those what we normally make is let's say a dipole now a dipole isn't an infinite what it is a dipole let's put a vertical dipole down here a dipole will radiate more that way and that way in free space and there's a difference between dbi and dbd at this point it's just over 2 db right so if we've got an antenna any antenna we'll use purple and it's got a gain of oh let's say 3 dbi that means the difference between this bit the edge of the dbi and there the difference is three small b small d big d big b right three now what does three db actually mean well every three db is doubling our power our, or our reception or our antenna gain or our optical clearness whatever they use in that in that uh, industry every 3 db so you can work and you can add and you can add dbs together so for instance if something is 6 db better than something else 
then we can quickly work out, well, 3 dB is doubling and 3 dB is doubling again. So if we had an amplifier that had a gain of 6 dB, all we need to do in our mind is going, well, if I'm doing 100 watts and this is a 6 dB gain, that's like going from 100 to 200 and from 200 to 400. So there's our 6 dB. And by the way, it's not linear. So 10 dB is actually tenfold, all right? So our 100 watt radio at uh, with a 10 dB gain amplifier is giving us the equivalent of 1,000 watts out the other end. So 10 dB is... Um, is a factor of 10. And you think, oh, it's not much difference between 10 and 13, for instance, but it's another 3 dB. And remember, 3 dB is doubling. So our 100 watt radio, which has sort of got a 10 dB amplifier, would be doing 1,000 watts, but a 13 dB amplifier would be doing 2,000 watts. So that's, that's dBs. We get to some interesting things when, um, I mean, when I was a young foundation student, I had a real complicated idea about dBs, <laughs> and a lot of it I just used to guess. So, for instance, the RSGB um, band plan, or the Ofcom, the Ofcom band plan, for instance, we're allowed, I don't know what it is, I think it's 16 dBW, I think, 16 dBW. What does that on top band? So on top band, for instance, we're allowed 16 dBW. I don't know if it is, by the way, so I'm going to have to look it up. But let's just pretend it's 16 dBW. How do people know it's 30-something watts, right? Well, we can do... Let me change the, turn the paper over. We can do it quite easy. If it was 16 dB, dBW, what does 16 dBW mean? Well, 1 W is 1 watt. So it's 16. Well, this is easy because 10, we know, is going to be 10 watts. 13 is going to be, double it again, 20 watts. And 16 is going to be double it again, so that's 40 watts. So it must be 15 dBW, I think, because I think it's 36. But anyway, by using a mismatch of threes, you can normally calculate in your mind exactly where someone's going with dBs, and that's really important in a minute. Okay. Next thing I want to cover before we head on to our obsession with antennas is the fun we have with takeoff angles. So let's go back to the planet Earth here. And we have an antenna sticking up off the ground. We, we kind of know if you in it, if you're watching this video, you're at the RSGB conference, conference uh, convention, or you're on YouTube or whatever, and you're watching this, you'll know some of these concepts anyway. But clearly, if I want to talk, if I'm here and I want to talk to another station there, it's pointless me sending my signal straight up in the air, in the main, right? There can be an advantage to that on very low bands where we want to go up refract and come straight back down and that's called NVIS that stands for near vertical incidence sky wave propagation where the signal goes straight up and straight down I'm not talking about that right now what I'm talking about is low angle radiation so in other words it's called takeoff angle we want our signal in the main to be to leave our station at a fairly low angle now, there's been some great experiments done on this and um, using all sorts of arrays of antennas and computers and switches and everything, listening to very long haul DX, long distance radio, and what angle they were receiving it at. And it's anywhere between up, up down to two degrees off the horizon. This is the long haul stuff up to about eight, maybe nine for long haul DX. On 80 metres, sometimes it can be a bit higher, apparently. Now, as a, I'm an antenna manufacturer, and I'm supposed to know some basic things, and for years I must have built about a 1,000 different models and certainly up to 100 different antennas and tested them all out in the back garden here. And what I discovered is it's hard to get low-angle transmit. It just is, OK? So if we want to make an antenna and measure it at, let's say, 10 degrees off the horizon 
it's actually a lot easier and you can convince yourself your antenna is quite a lot better at 10 degrees than it is at 5. As long as you measure everything at 5 degrees of horizon, you'll know that normally, under normal circumstances, and this is a VHF or very tall tower, right? But there are some exceptions to everything. In the main, 5 degrees will give you a good baseline if an antenna is going to perform for DX, long haul stuff. 5 degrees. I'm doing that now because we're going to get in to do a little bit of 5 degrees on here. Um, I think it's worthwhile just covering what antennas are made of. I'm not going to do I'm not, I'm not going to do this business of how does an antenna work. I remember seeing a 1970s um, documentary and they had the cameraman and the producer trying to convince this professor, right? about when he was about when they're about to go live and about to interview him the question is going to be how does an antenna work <laughs> there's this professor going why would anybody want to know that well, it turns out that he could explain it but it would take him well over an hour and nobody in their right mind would ever understand it so i call it the magic of radio and i remember on one of my videos once somebody actually left a comment probably one of these professors it doesn't help anybody if you call it magic. Well, obviously, it's not really magic, right? But if we're going to make an antenna, we need to make it out of a conductive material. Now, we know what resistance is. Resistance is measured in ohms, okay? So if something has a res resistance, we use resistors in circuits and all sorts of things. Conductivity is also a parameter we can measure, normally in Siemens per meter, all right? So... For instance, copper has a pretty good um, conductivity. And there's a good chart on the internet, which I'll just fire up now. So here it is. Uh, silver has got a very good electrical conductivity of 10 to the 6 Siemens per metre. Copper is 58.7, gold 44, aluminium 36.9, and so on and so forth. It's important to know, because if we want to make an antenna out of iron, let's say, it, it has fairly low resistance, it does conduct electricity. So does my finger, by the way, but it doesn't make a very good antenna. So bearing in mind that you've got the precious metals like silver and gold, they're very, very expensive. I don't know anybody in their right mind that would make a 80-metre make a Yagi out of gold. Um, silver, of course, would be the best. So copper is a good i mean it, well, it's one down from silver basically aluminium's not too bad either so to conclude on the conductivity side we're never going to use silver or gold for our antennas the copper is cheap enough to be able to use and so is aluminium and they're not too far apart on the conductivity states that conductivity by the way is going to come in in a minute when we look at seawater okay so as a young foundation student i used to love the idea of modeling antennas and I learned, taught myself everything, by the way, but I learned how to drive one particular software modelling programme that I could draw antennas in and then start to see the result. It's got to the point now I can look at an antenna and I think, well, I know what that's going to do. In the main, assuming it's tuned correctly and that sort of thing. Before we go down there, I've got a little analogy for you that you may like. And when, if you're ever doing a presentation at a club night or whatever, or you're trying to explain what an antenna is to someone who has no idea what amateur radio or RF is. That you, you might like this analogy. And I accidentally bumped into this analogy when I was trying to explain how my antenna worked to my accountant. And I said, well, the shortwave spectrum, in fact, the whole RF spectrum is a little bit like a piano. So the long straight strings pay, play the low notes and the short strings play the high notes. Well, just like RF, the long wires do the low frequencies and the short wires do the high frequencies. And we can use that analogy and we can head in now to MMANA. And I'll show you how to get to that on the screen. Just do a Google search for MMANA dash GAL. Follow this link and fairly near the bottom, you'll be able to download this completely free. So when you fire it up, it looks something like this. We have basically four tabs across here. So I can quickly draw 
um, an antenna that's let's say 5.2 meters long and it will automatically fill the rest in in zeros i can go and view that antenna and there it is actually i can hold the control button down and slide that one down that is my 5.2 um antenna i can zoom in and out that says z there in the middle i can zoom in and out and i can right click here and add a feed point or a source to the beginning of the wire which is at the bottom so that's where our coax would go Okay, this is a ground mounted vertical as it so happens. I've gone back to here because it's added this here wire one base. That means that's where the feed point is. You don't need to know anything else. In fact, it's defaults to 14, I think 0.15. Let's have it a bit higher up. It doesn't really matter to be honest. So we can view that here and we can start to calculate. We don't add any height. It knows it's a ground mounted vertical now. We're going to make it out of copper wire and this is for real. So it's not a simulated free space antenna, you know, like on the moon. Well, not even on the moon because that would start to behave a little bit like an antenna on the earth. So we've got free space. We've got perfect and real. We don't want perfect either because we don't have a perfectly conductive surface on the ground. We can set up our ground and we'll give it 16 quarter wave radials just for a bit of fun and let's just see what that does and uh, it's giving us an impedance of about 38 um, ohms swr of 1.49 and it's got a gain maximum gain is 1.12 dbi so we can go to the far field plot now and this is what it looks like so on the left we've got our plan view that our, our bumblebee flying over the top of the antenna if it could see the rf dispersing out from the middle it would look like this elevation views on the right and we can hold our cursor and drag this around and measure things so at 20 degrees off the horizon it says we're 0 0.8 dbi you've got to remember this is you need to build another antenna and measure the two which, which we'll do in a minute i just want you to remember one number in a minute slide down to five degrees off the horizon and it says minus six minus six dbi in the middle up here minus I think if i hit a button you can see it says says it there that's a really important number to have because minus six sounds a bit rubbish doesn't it but with that minus six i've talked to people all over the world <laughs> in an omnidirectional vertical minus six let's just remember that i mentioned seawater earlier on and what we can do on the ground setup just to simulate what seawater does, which has a conductivity of 5,000 millisiemens per meter. And let's start that off. And then you'll know why some of these D expeditions are so strong because our minus six has now become 4.2. So it's effectively a 10 dB kick. We'll draw a couple of other antennas just for fun. So let's get rid of this one and I'll quickly draw a dipole, let's say for 20 meters small inverted v dipole 20 meters here we go right there's our dipole the feed point is at the wrong end of this one here so i'm just going to cha change that to wire one end okay so we've got x on our right hand side y going north and z coming straight up and we can calculate that as well. And we shouldn't be far out on the SWR. Well, we were, but it doesn't really matter. I'll quickly adjust that. It says it's at 14. Best is 14.5. Whatever. 14.5. And we'll be at the wrong height above ground as well. This is... It's only two metres above the ground, it tells me here. So we probably need to add a little... We'll add a couple of metres say five meters we we'll probably get a slightly better swr and we do and then we can adjust the ends and all sorts but what i'm interested in is the far field plot okay at uh i'll just check the height so the height of this is z2 two meters plus five right so we're seven meters above the ground at the inverted v and it goes down a couple of meters your average reasonable apple tree <laughs> there we are and that's what the far field plot looks like and what we'll do is we'll raise the height up in a minute but before we do that let's just measure some things 
So you can see that the wire at the moment is running north-south. Therefore, like any traditional dipole, we'll be getting most of the gain off the uh, perpendicular <laughs> to the wire. Okay, so we can take our cursor and we can come down to here at 175 degrees off of the horizon, getting minus 8.3. We were at six a minute ago. So we're 2.3 dBs, slightly worse with this one. We need to raise it up a bit. Well, let's find out what happens when we do raise this up. So this is at seven. Let's have a look at nine. There's 11. That's 13. Here's 15. Here's 17 meters now. Now let's go to a whole wavelength off the ground at, on the 20 meter band. So here we go. So you saw what was happening there is that as we got higher and higher off the ground, we get fingers develop. Yeah, that's well, I don't know if that's the official term, but uh, I call them fingers. These Philip fingers develop and we get these nulls going on inside here. We've got a null there of minus 10. But where our main gain is still coming out here. And if we come down to minus five degrees off the horizon, we're 2.9 dB. So that's nearly 10 dB better than the straight vertical by being a whole wavelength off the ground. By the way, if that's 40 meters, then we're well over 100 feet. OK, it's the 40 meter band after all. I just think that's cool how a height above ground effects. A couple of things actually start happening when you do lift it off the ground. As you go higher, the tune will change. Certainly up to a quarter of a wavelength. So if you're into 80 meters, a quarter of a wavelength at 80 meters is 20 meters high, so 60 feet. As you faff around with your 80 meter dive bowl going up and down, you'll notice that not only is the impedance changing, but so will be what the element lengths need to be. So certainly up to a quarter of a wavelength off the ground, I always think this is a seagull, okay? For seagulls sitting on the edge and you come along and shoo it away, it stretches its wings as it goes up. And that's what we need to do with a, a low band dipole. As you start to raise it up, the elements start to get longer. As it starts to get closer to the ground, I think because of capacitance with the ground, the elements can get a bit shorter. Not only that, is the SWR isn't fixed at 72 ohms. Okay, it goes past 50, then it goes up at the top and comes back. And I'll find a graph to show you. Here we are, I found the graph. And you can see how it goes up and down relative to the height above ground. So a dipole is only got its 72 ohms in free space. It's not 72 ohms when it's really on the, you know, near the ground. OK, let's move down to the 40 meter band and I've adjusted the same antenna for 40 meters. We've got an added height of six meters here, plus the two meters we had in stock. You remember? And we'll hit the start button, ignore the SWR because the far field plot won't change. All right. Here's the far field plot. Now, what can we see here? We can see that our north south dipole is still producing a little bit more east west at eight meters above the ground. All right. And bearing in mind that if that was on 80 meters, that would be two eights of 16. This would be 16 meters above the ground now. Now, a lot of people, they start to tell you that their dipole is, you know, for 40 meters, you know, <laughs> running across the top of a tree somewhere and it's north south. And they think most of their gain is east west. You see, it's not. Let's just run the cursor around. Let's, this is our max, roughly max gain. I think actually the default is 45 degrees. So at 45 degrees, which is a nice takeoff angle for the 500, 300, 400, 500 mile hop that we have on 40 meters during the day. Do you remember? Well, no, you don't remember because I haven't told you that, but we do. And I just round that. It says here five point, whoops, it says here 5.7. And if we scroll to the top, it says 2.2, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's only about 3 dB difference. 3 dB is equivalent of going, if you remember, from 50 watts to 100 watts. You'd, I, I defy anybody to honestly go, yeah, I can hear 3 dB, right? It's not enough to worry about. Just get it down. And bearing in mind, that's at 40 meters. 
This was on 80 metres. This is the equivalent of going from 8 metres to 16 metres high. Now, I don't know many people with a 16 metre high dipole or doublet or any shape antenna, maybe with balance lines or a big fat tuna, that can deliver um, gain perpendicular for 80 metres. You need to go right up. And I'll just show you that now. Let's recalculate this because I was 3.75. That's 130 feet. Let's say 35, 33 metres plus the two we've got roughly. 32 metres. This is very high. I realise the tune's a little bit out of shape. Resonance. It thinks it's at 3.96. Well, we could faff around with that. So at 32 metres, which is uh, a third of a wavelength, roughly, on 80 metre band, we are getting this. And we put a dipole on top of a 100-foot tower, above the Yagis, right at the top. And we, we put this... Uh, and we realised that actually we need a pair. We need to switch it because this was going to be for... I can do something here. I can force this to show me. Tell me what is happening at five degrees off the horizon. So we were after DX in the middle of the night for 80 meters. That was going to be North America, which is delivering minus 3.7. Pretty good. South America was going to be down here, minus 8.2. So there was quite a lot of difference between the two. So what we did is we put a pair of dipoles with more coax and another switch. Tell me about it. Anyway, just interested. So on 80 metres now, if you've got a 10 metre high dipole, I'm sorry if I'm labouring this point. It's a bubble of RF. That's what I call it, a bubble of RF. Honestly, it doesn't really matter what the shape is of the antenna. It's a bubble of RF in the main on 80 metres. And look, I mean, we can, we can, this is, I think, at 45 degrees off the horizon. I think so. Which is your average... 45 degrees during the day is your average loafy around. Fine, you know, you're in Manchester talking to Fred in Brighton, about 45 degrees. Minus 5.8 there, minus 2.5 there. 3 dB in it. You'd never know. All right. Interesting. So basic software modelling is damn good fun. And doesn't that, it not only teaches you how it works and what's happening in terms of the energy coming off the antenna, but it allows you to start to get ahead of the curve when you're starting to plan antennas, that's all. I'll go back to the book here. This isn't, I'm not trying to, <laughs> I fully appreciate there's a lot of people in this convention, there's a lot of people on YouTube, and every video I make, there are professors and very clever people watching it. A lot of them trying to catch me out. I'm pretty sure of it. But I'm here to give you inspiration on the one hand. It's also a bit of fun, isn't it? Right? It's kind of edu it's education and, what's the other word? Entertainment. Education and entertainment. They go hand in hand. Because if it's boring as hell, you're not going to watch it anyway. Multi-banding antennas is quite good fun. So if we take a dipole, for instance. Now, dipole with our coax coming off the middle and let's say these are roughly 10 meter legs will be resonant on let's say 7.1 megahertz right now technically according to the books that's resonant three times the value of what we've just got so if it's resonant on 7.1 it's actually the next time it's resonant it says here according to the maths it would be resonant on 21.33 yeah it's not, right, because we've got the height above ground has changed as a percentage of the wavelength. It's got a lot higher now, basically. And it's now a three-quarter wave dipole, effectively, for 21 metres. So that's its next resonance. Just multiply by three, OK? So if you could take um, any band, multiply it by three, will be its next harmonic. Now, the only... The only <laughs> In the main, that's the only one we normally need to be worried about. Because if you're making a fan dipole, in other words, and just for the case you don't know, right, you've got a piece of coax that looks like that. And normally a coax has got a centre conductor, normally made of copper, and it has this braid on the outside, right? So if you don't know anything about amateur radio, just remember what a, um, the coax from your TV used to look like. 
right? All that people don't have that anymore either, do they? Anyway, so a dipole basically is that end goes one side of this and that end there goes the other side of it. Effectively, that's what's happening. A fan dipole is fascinating. So what we can do is if these are 10 meter legs, we can then do five meter legs off the same feed point with no other contraption. And that will automatically get the middle band, which for us is going to be 20 meter band. And 20 meter band is roughly 14 megahertz. So then you've got a dipole for that one does that one that's going red. So this is going to do 40 and 15. And that one is going to do 20 meter band. You could add another one, either longer one going this way for 80 meters, or maybe a little baby one in here for the 10 meter band. Fan dipole. Another way of just kind of multi banding an antenna would be to go down the loop route. So a loop, a basic loop, and I had one of these in my garden for years, and a lot of people know this because I talk about it quite a lot because I loved it, is that the you use something called a four to one ballon here, right? Because this has roughly got an impedance of 200 ohms. And our coax that goes to our radio is normally 50 ohms. So we need to divide that by four to equal 50. So we use a four to one ballon. Okay, which connects to this point here and then the coax back. Now a loop resonates on every frequency. So 7.1, 14.2, 21.2, 21 and so on and so forth. And you get the 10 meter band as well, obviously 28.4. So loops are good fun as well. You don't need to do anything fancy to multiband a loop. Unless you do, uh, you want a monoband loop, but we won't cover that now because you can feed it with a quarter wave, less the velocity factor of 75 ohm, 75 ohm coax. And that would give you a transformer from your loop to your coax, to your radio, but then it'd be monoband. It would only do the one frequency, normally the target frequency you were originally after. So loop, then we've got the end fed and the end fed uses a little contraption, either a 49 to one or a 64 to one transformer our coax comes in here and then out the other end this transformer here and out the other end we've got an end fed and an end fed is a half way it's resonant and the half wave which is opposite to a dipole well <laughs> for each element it would be so if we've got a 40 meter element for a half wave it'd be quite a long it'd be it'd be 20 meters long all right, so that would be 20 meter length. So that is 20 meters. It would also be resonant on its doubles. So you'd get that on the 20 meter band as well. Uh, the jury's out between 49 and 64. But you can make either quite easy, right? Hence the two. Mike and I like the idea of a 64. Yeah, whatever. And then of course, the last thing is that I wanted to cover today. If you can make a fan dipole, you can make a fan vertical. Hey, and this is, this was an accident. Seriously, an accident I had where I had a telescopic pole and I had a 40 meter wire going up it, right? 40 meters. And it was ground mounted. So the coax, center of the coax goes up the, up the pole and the braid I just put on on the ground you see connected it obviously on a few radials probably about eight or ten you can use more i've covered that plenty of times on on youtube but what i discovered on the same feed point i could put let's say a 20 up the side and i was getting 40 and 20 and that developed until i now put six elements up a dx commander that's a fan vertical and that works at about minus five minus six db at five degrees off horizon i just want to cover that one thing before we before we close this off um ladies and gentlemen which is many 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 years ago <laughs> um a lot of people had two antennas they had their main transmit antenna and a receive antenna but then the uh, Yagi technology came along and people realized actually you could do it all on one antenna, all right? 
But, you know, I think the world has changed again. And because of all the local noise we're getting on our antennas, there is an argument to say, well, the radios are so good these days. Why don't we put a dedicated antenna? It could be a loop on the ground, for instance. Just Google it, loop on the ground. Plenty of people that have done loops on the ground. And put that into your receive jack. And that way, because the thing is about a vertical, for instance, it gets out very well. And I used to make a terrible mistake of only using my antennas for receive for the testing. I go, oh, I don't like that. Right? <laughs> I didn't realise that it was transmitting really well. But it was just picking up maybe more noise. Because let's think about this. A vertical antenna will pick it's got well we know it's got very low angle gain capabilities so if you've got a house a couple of doors away generating some sort of stuff from the back of his fridge or whatever your vertical is going to pick it up quite well whereas your low to the ground ish dipole isn't so much so i i challenge everybody these days to have a look at look at the back of your radio has it got a receive jack for 10 pounds five bucks <laughs> you can build a nice little receive loop you can pin it down on the grass outside no one will ever see it within about three weeks and it'll give you a lovely option on receive and your radio is perfectly good enough without having a preamplifier. the topic of antennas obviously is enormous we can go down yagis we can go down log periodics there are books to have um a half hour or so presentation about antennas to cover all the, all the topics of antennas it's gonna um it is impossible we'd have to play it a thousand times the speed um if you look at uh on4 un's book low band dxing book i think there's something like 18 chapters i've skimmed the surface of everything antennas are fantastic they're great fun they're the one thing in life that makes the difference between a reasonable station and a very good station and i encourage you all to go out there Play with receive loops, get an apple tree, throw a vertical up it for 20 metres, for instance. A few radials on the ground. Try low to the ground. I went as low as four feet off the ground on 40 metres before I started noticing a difference that the receive was starting to die. People could still hear me. Unless you do these experiments, you'll never know. And somebody once said to me, I don't know why you're doing this. It's already been done and it's been written in such and such a book. The thing is, I hadn't done it. And a couple of topics I've now challenged and changed, including, for instance, a very high sky loop and a triangle configuration has massive gain opposite the feed point. And I remember originally having arguments with this. I think I have finally won that one now. But just because it's been done before and you haven't done it doesn't mean to say you can't. So go and have fun. Enjoy your radio. Enjoy your antennas. And I'll see you on the next one. So from Callum here at World Headquarters in the bunker, a very good day. We've been expecting you, Mr. McGonagh. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody... I enjoyed making it. Yeah, somebody said, uh, this guy could make life inside a ping pong ball sound entertaining. I don't know, and maybe for about two minutes, Jim, and that's about it. And I've got, I can see a comment from Ray, N9JA, who should be on the other stream yeah. at the moment, saying, yeah. great presentation. I know. He's not watching it's, himself, uh... he's watching you. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course. You know, hey. But so, uh, I did I did pick I saw a lovely, really interesting question, actually. Oh, I'm taking, stealing your thunder, Jim. Yeah, because it's probably one of I those things down here. Uh, well, oh, go on. You, you asked the one that I think you're going to ask me. No, you, you asked me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm still trying to catch up. There is so much going on on the chat since you came on. Oh, uh, right. So, have, you, have you seen the love on there? Yeah, fine. So well, I've been having so to, I did a trick. to write it down. Yeah, I, I, I went live 10 minutes before this show and showed the people the behind the scenes, what I was doing, what the screen was doing and everything else. Got me, put my lights on, changed the batteries for the camera and then... And then I shut my stream down and asked everybody to come over here. So that's why we're up to 300 watching now. So I thought it was uh, just a little, well, I didn't want them to, I wanted them to catch the live uh, um, adrenaline. You know, it, it's, 
pre-recorded is fine, but, you know, live has a little bit more zip in it sometimes. Absolutely. So Andy oh. Cowley, I don't actually know the answer to this one, but he said, does the material, thickness of the material, uh, have an effect on the bandwidth? I, th I think the answer is yes. How much? I don't know. But I've got a great story. Now, Jim, as a <clears throat> experienced radio foreman, you'll know that Droitwich has got two 800-foot towers. And I'll just do fire to the other camera at the minute. So these two uh, 800, and there's an antenna that basically does that across the top. This is the antenna bit here. It goes up here. It's purple, but anyway, I could use red. Red's better. That's the antenna. Now, about a few years ago, Chris G0EYO told me that when they, the bandwidth wasn't enough. Now, I'm not quite sure what an AM carrier is, but I just while the stream was going, I worked out the six kilohertz bandwidth on a 198 kilohertz uh, transmitter. The bandwidth difference on that antenna is 46 meters wide, a, a difference. So in other words, at one edge, three kilohertz down to three kilohertz up is the equivalent of 46 meters. So what they had to do is wide band it by putting four big, long wires up and, and literally multi, you know, making the making the antenna big enough just to fit the AM signal in. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the, I, I say it's the magic of radio, but that's, to me, some of these some of these problems, I mean, I think a lot of us who are into amateur radio, we love problem solving in a wonderful, weird way. I mean, some people just want to buy the radio and get it to work, but a lot of us like to buy the radio and get it to work. <laughs> He kind of quite liked the thing the day when it goes, hang on a minute, it's not working now. <laughs> we spend a week, you know, solving all the problems, but we learn through that, don't we? Because mm. you can read all the books in the world. If you don't fix these problems yourselves or have someone to help you and so you can see it, it doesn't really matter. It's it's doing it that, that does it. Interesting thing about Droitwich, in the days when we could visit places, I was I was there and I've stood underneath one of those masts. And not only can you feel the hairs on the back of your neck standing up with all the power that's that's around, yeah. there's a lock on a gate because there's, there's lifts going up uh, some of those masts and there's a lock to stop you, you know, getting in there without permission. That's and right. You can hear the programme. You can hear the programme <laughs> yeah, on the lock. On the gate. On the, on the gate. Yeah. I've been to that gate. I've yeah. actually listened to Radio yes, 4 yeah. on a lock. Uh, that's right. And then there that's was right. a lady that complained because Radio 4 was coming out of a kettle. That's right. <laughs> of course, the, the, the feeders are not, not coax. I mean, it's plumbing, basically, isn't it? It's plumbing. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think they're underground, two big underground cables, because that's a very high-powered transmitter, 400 kilowatts, I think, it's, at it's, 198 it's kilohertz. Tremendous. And it's built on a kind of inland sea. It, it, the, the, there's something about the ground, isn't there? there? I didn't know it's that. Very salt, it's very salty or something. Because ah. it's Droid, which is a, it is a spa. Actually, talking about terrain, Mike, G4CDF, says uh, he reckons terrain also matters. And he says, even on HF, go to the top of a hill. What do you reckon? Yeah. So the reason why you go to the top of the hill, I did a video about this. The slope, how does the the slope of the ground oddities but basically if you imagine this right if you were on a, a slope how are we off for time uh, we're all right we're all right we've got a few minutes if if you i mean i'll just exacerbate this or whatever it's called uh, we know that normally the, with the effect of the ground you've got this you know you know if if you're lucky you'll get a five degree takeoff angle but if it's running away from you what happens is this takeoff angle is relative to the ground, not gravity. So this comes down. So yeah, get up high because you're still gonna you still get the effect, not so much on the well, maybe on the ground. Well, you your takeoff angle goes down relative to the slope of the ground in front of you. So even if you're just on a like you're on a field day or stuff, and you think, oh, most of my contacts are going to be Germany. And it's a bit of a slope. My Germany's not so bad because normally the takeoff is a bit hang higher. But like at Uplands Farm, for instance, it was a very, I'd say about four, 
four degree slant going up towards the US. That's going to add four degrees to my takeoff angle. So, yeah, get up high or just consider where the slope is. Right, oh, and by the way, ZL1BD says lobes were the word you were looking for. Yeah, not I know. <laughs> I've got a Zoom call with Roly. Uh, Monday night, his Tuesday morning. So he'll tell me off then, no doubt. Because Roly checks through all my material <laughs> and then uh, sends, me a, sends me a message when I've got it wrong. It's actually going bonkers on the uh, thing at the minute. You you, you said that um, the DX Commander came about as a pure accident. Yes, it was. Yeah. But so how did you then make the step then to becoming a manufacturer of... Because you, you were running a business. I was running a business, and weirdly enough, Jim, it was about four years ago, you came to the Withal Rally, and I had about 10 prototype DX Commanders. I thought it was quite, be f- quite good fun, and I think I was selling them for about £80 each. I mean, they were quite chunky things. You bought one, Jim. I did. I've still got <laughs> you it. took it to France. Um, and it was just an accident. And then when I, as I got a bit older, because I'm 62 and a half now, I got fed up, you know, with a suit and tie brigade because I had this business that, you know, I just got completely fed up with it. I was burnt out and I I thought, you only live once. Let's see if I can make DX Commander a bit of a goer. So, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of a planned out, but we got it to the business to the point now where I'm employed, my son's employed, Wendy's employed, we've got a small factory and, and I've got 40,000 people on the YouTube channel, but I've obviously had to work hard, you know, every step of the way. Uh, but the product itself was an accident. The fact, I mean, there has been, I mean, I have seen designs since where somebody puts up a wire, you know, there's the ground, and then a feed point, and they put the verticals up like this, um, like genuinely like a fan. But um, I've never seen anybody do it on a pole. And I noticed some weirdies, depending on if if I spread the feed point out further, I was getting better bandwidth, basically, rather than the top, if I spread the bottom where the feed was. So, and I, I actually haven't finished all the experiments I want to do because I've been so busy, but, and I never will, I'm sure, Jim. Yeah. Well, look, Rob has just whispered in my ear, Rob is doing all the technicals with Don yeah. down in Cambridge. It's something about uh, your thoughts on, was it elevated halfway f- dipole? Halfway verticals, elevated halfway verticals. Elevated, well, you can model that. You don't need to do it. So this would be an end-fed halfway vertical. I think Tim's on the channel. I'm not quite sure if Tim uh, G5TM's done that. I do have, I think, nine 64 to 1 high-powered. Mike made them for me. I've never told anybody about it. High-powered. I wanted it to cope with about 800 watts SSB end-feds. They're quite big boxes, and we're going to try uh, and do that. So I don't know the answer yet, uh, how it works. Is it any good? <coughs> um, modelling will, will, will solve that problem, and I might do some models before I actually build it, Jim. Yeah, watch this space, eh? Yeah. No, but the videos, um, we've, we've got just got a few seconds before we have to uh, uh, yeah. wrap up and go to the RC. But uh, what about the videos? You, you must be making 100 a week or something. <laughs> quite a few anyway so on average it's two to three a week i genuinely don't know how i do it i ch- try and film a lot of things that doesn't end up in any of the videos um and i've just got all this footage i think oh it's just me opening a box i think you know uh, but some of the, if i can just film it good enough it can end up i mean it's like a story isn't it so you will watch something on the TV, you'll watch something on YouTube. If the story's good, all right, so you've got the background, you know where it's going, the middle bit's quite good fun, you, you will just watch it because it's a good story. And I think the trick is, it doesn't matter if you're wiring up a plug. You can wire up a plug. Now, tell them a little while you're doing it, tell them a bit of the history about a three-pin plug. You know, why is it, a, you know, whatever. And so... And that's what I do. Now, two weeks ago, we did an experiment where I launched one video a day for 10 days, plus three live streams. <laughs> but I'd, I'd built them up. And um, I just, because uh, during the summer, my channel had not died. It, it, it slowed, the growth had slowed. And I'm a businessman. I, I want, and I'm driven. 
down the road to get 100,000 subscribers because it's the only thing in my world that I can't buy. You get a little plaque from YouTube, you see. And I just, just thought it'd be fun. Third of it's the way about through three or four, you? three or four yeah. years away, I think. But okay. So well, sorry, I, I keep that, moving that about because uh, I look like I'm being scanned by aliens. Uh, Jim, it's the, absolutely fine. We know you've got this special condition. <laughs> <laughs> right, time to go. Thank. You. That's been brilliant, Callum. Thanks ever, ever so much. Uh, I uh, hope to see you very My soon on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, the love is still coming in on the, on the uh, what do you call it, YouTube call, yeah. uh, chat facility. That's the word. I know. It's, it's been a long day, it? Callum. Been a long day. Jim, well, mate, you take, must you be, uh, you, you, you're you going to need a medal. Hopefully they'll stick you on the front cover of um, of Radcom sometime. Oh, someone was suggesting you should be on the front cover of uh, Radcom. <laughs> That's when I get my CBE. <laughs> oh, okay. Or when, or when I'm knighted. Yeah. All right, mate. <laughs> okay, well. guys. Thanks, thanks so much, Jim, and all Thank the crew down much. at RSGB.